Hello there. Welcome to our channel. My name is Aubrey Duncan and I'm with Advent Truth Ministries. Our mission is to lift up Jesus Christ as the only Savior of the world, to prepare his people for his soon coming and to share his prophetic end time truths. Please like our channel. Be sure to subscribe and feel free to comment. I pray that you will be blessed by the message today. Good morning and blessed Sabbath, everyone. And Amen. do want to take this opportunity Amen. to welcome us to the physical sanctuary here. Those of us that are gathered here, our visitors and regular members. And also we want to take this opportunity to welcome those of you that are listening on internet land. What an awesome God that we serve, that he has provided men and women the knowledge to develop the technology that we could be here in this little humble town of uh, Forsyth, Georgia, but that men and women around the world could hear the words of truth. We thank you so much. And we know and realize that many of you or some of you that may be listening this morning, you uh, do not understand why you perhaps may have been informed or maybe you've even been fighting against uh, keeping the Lord's Sabbath. And we just uh, want to do as we do each week, is to give us a Sabbath nugget. And this week we want to go directly to our great example, Jesus himself. And the Bible tells us in the book of Luke that shortly after Jesus uh, was baptized, anointed by the Holy Spirit, that he went into his hometown of Nazareth. And the Bible records in the book of, uh, of Luke, and I begin in verse 14, chapter 4 and verse 14, and the Bible reads, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out the fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all, and so he began the work of an itinerant preacher going from synagogue to synagogue or church to church, from neighborhood to neighborhood, preaching the word of salvation, repent for the kingdom of God is come. And then in verse 16 of the same chapter, the Bible records, and he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, Jesus chose the Sabbath as he went into the synagogue in his hometown to declare to them who he was, truly who he was, the promised Messiah. And as the Bible continues, it goes on to tell them why he was sent, why he had come. Going back and looking at the words of the prophet Isaiah, he declared, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to, to preach the gospel to the poor, had sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those that are bruised and to preach the acceptable lay of the Lord. So if the Sabbath day was good for Jesus, for him to coming into the synagogue and to declare to the world who he is and what his mission is all about. It certainly is good for us. And so again, we come on his Sabbath day in his sanctuary of time to give him praise and thanks and to share a word of truth. And we pray that soon and very soon, someone that is listening that have not accepted the Lord's Sabbath may be convicted that this is what the Lord is calling you to do. But let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this special time that you have given to us, that we may come apart from the challenges of the world and to come and find sweet communion with you. Strengthen our hearts, dear Father. May you bring the realization to our, to our minds that on this day, that you pour out special blessings onto your children, but we could only get it if we are obedient to thee. So help us to be obedient. I pray this morning that as we share that 
Your Holy Spirit will take control of my heart, will take control of the hearts of the hearers. And that whatever is said and done will be done to thy name's honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen. 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 Last week the world celebrated what we call uh, Easter. And of course we shared from this uh uh, position here last week that it is more important to have a relationship with Jesus Christ by being obedient to his commandments than to follow the tradition of men and of course show that the Easter celebration it's nothing more about the tradition of men but we by God's grace I pray went on to share with us what the Bible teaches us about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last week, it was also the beginning of the Jewish Passover, which tells us more about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ than any Easter celebration, Easter eggs or Easter bunnies could tell us about. But now, but now Easter is over, and I wonder how many of us have considered where did Jesus go after his resurrection? And more importantly, what is he doing wherever he is? As we shared with you last week again, the reality of his death, burial, and resurrection, and as we study the feast of the Jewish Passover, we showed from God's word what exactly he requires of us and what he requires of us to celebrate his resurrection. And certainly it was not a day that can't be found in the Holy Word, in his Holy Word. But what we discovered is that the way we celebrate Jesus' resurrection is to allow him to come in through the power of his Holy Spirit and to transform our lives and so the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians in the 5th chapter. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things have become, and behold, all things have become new. And that's how we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ to allow him to come into our hearts, to our minds, to transform our lives and to make us reflectors of his character so that the world may see that we serve a God, that we serve a God that has the power to change our lives from, from wickedness to righteousness. That's what the power of his resurrection is all about. I'm not just about today, but today by God's grace, I invite you to join with me as we look a little deeper into this whole idea, this concept, if you will, of the Passover. And as Paul tells us, that Jesus Christ is our Passover that was sacrificed for us, what it really means. And we'll take a little deeper look into salvation, salvation in the sanctuary. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, God's plan of redemption for human souls is best understood in the context of the sanctuary. But what is the sanctuary? As we look in the book of Psalms in the 77th division of the Psalms and the 14th verse, the 13th verse, the psalmist Asper writes to us, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. Oh, how great a God is our God. Oh yes, if we want to know God, then that's where we go. We go and we take a look. Oh yes, into the ancient Jewish sanctuary. Yes, of course, but more importantly, into his heavenly sanctuary. David would declare, They have seen thy goings forth, my God, in thy sanctuary. And so, as the Jewish people were now delivered from Egyptian bondage after 400 years, 
by their chosen leader, Moses. God now spoke to Moses and he told the people, told them, I've told the people through Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I want you to know this morning, it was not that God had no place to dwell, but it is because that simply he wanted to be among his people and to teach them of his love, to let them know and understand of his justice and to help them by his grace to become more like him. And he continued to speak to Moses according to the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof even so shall thou make it. So God is now telling Moses, what you're going to build under my instructions is merely a pattern of the reality that is in heaven. So what God is telling Moses, what I'm going to have your people do, the experience that they would have at the, with the sanctuary, they would get a better understanding of what I'm doing on their behalf in the heavenly sanctuary so that they may be returned to them, to me. Earth, the earth is the pattern. The heavenly is the reality. And so Moses continued. He took God's instructions and he went along as God advised, as God directed. And the earthly sanctuary that was built, it was um, a portable physical structure which constituted the center of the uh, Jewish economy and, and their culture as they traveled for 40 years from Sinai to Canaan on their way on their journey to the promised land. The sanctuary itself was a structure, as I said, that was about 75 feet wide and 150 feet long. And it comprised of two apartments, the holy place and the most holy place. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the priests would minister in the holy place every day, all day long. But the most holy place on once a year, on the day of atonement, only the holy priest was able to go in to the most, who only the priest, the high priest, was able to go in into the most holy place and to minister uh, on the behalf of God's people. The entire structure and everything that related to the sanctuary were all foreshadowing of God, what God would do for the salvation of not only the Jewish nation, but for the entire human race. It was his plan of redemption that was laid before the foundation of the earth. The tabernacle. The tabernacle was surrounded by a curtain of pure white uh, uh, linen that enclosed that uh, 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 structure. But what is that pure white linen? What does it represent? If we go to the book of Revelation and the 19th chapter, the Bible makes it very clear what that pure white linen represented. In verse 7 of chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, the Bible reads, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in, in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. But how do the saints get that righteousness? It is the righteousness of Jesus that he gives to us when we come to him. Amen. And so now as the, the sinners would come from outside of the camp, they would now come through the door of that white linen, that white linen depicting the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which we must be covered with. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, in the book of Romans, in the book of Romans, the third chapter, 
Paul tells us about how that righteousness of Jesus Christ that was depicted with the white linen is given to us. And Paul writes in the book of Romans, the third chapter, beginning in the 21st verse, and he writes, but now, but now, he says, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. He continued, and even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this morning I want to say, unfortunately, that so many of our, my Christian friends believe and teach that because of our, the righteousness is so freely given to us, that there's nothing else for us to do. We don't have to keep God's law. But I thank God for his word because Paul did not stop there. And I pray this morning that our friends would keep on reading because if they keep on reading, this is what they would come into, can be confronted with because Paul now writes in verse 31 of the same chapter, the very same chapter that he just said that we are saved by the righteousness of Jesus and not by our keeping of the law. He then writes, do we then make void the law of God through faith? God forbid we establish the law. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, as we come to Jesus Christ and he gives us that which we do not deserve, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we come to him, he freely covers us with his righteousness. But the Bible declares in the book of Romans, the fourth chapter and verse, uh, and verse uh, uh, 17, it says, for God, uh, uh, it says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, talking about Abraham, before him whom he believed, even God who quickened the dead, and called those things which be not as though they were. We serve a loving God, so as we come to him, in the filth of our righteousness, he now covers us. In the filth of our unrighteousness, I'm sorry. He now covers us with his righteousness. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, when the Father looks upon us, he does not see our filth, our wickedness, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I think about the thief on the cross, recognizing that that man that was next to him, if you may call him a man, on that cross in the middle was none other than the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Then he pleaded with him. He said, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And what was, what was Jesus' response? I say unto you today, I say unto you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise, which is future. That's another sermon altogether. Jesus did not tell the man that he's going to be with him in paradise on that day because the Bible is very clear. When the disciples, the women came to anoint Jesus' body on the third day after he had arisen, the angel told him he's not here, but he is risen. The Bible records that as they tried to touch him, he says, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my father. So obviously he did not go to paradise, to heaven that day. And he certainly was not telling the thief on the cross that he would go to him to, with paradise on that day. But that's another sermon altogether. Coming back to the sanctuary. As the penitent sinner, because that's what they are, that's what we all are, and we are in need of a savior. As they would come from different parts of the camp, they would now come to the tabernacle. But on the white curtain, on the white curtain, there was a door which they had to enter 
in order to get to the tabernacle itself. And this is what we read in the book of John and John the 10th uh, uh, chapter and the 7th verse. Jesus speaking, he says, Verily I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 9 in the 10th chapter of John. I am the door, by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go out and find pasture. So what was the tabernacle teaching us that white curtain? As we come in that through the door of that white curtain, we now enter into the pure righteousness we're covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But the penitent sinner had to bring an animal with them as they come in. Because the reason that they were coming to the tabernacle in the first place is to confess and to be forgiven of their sins. And so they would bring an animal, usually a lamb. They would deliver it to the priest. The priest was uh, examine it. And you could find this in, in more uh, 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 detail in the book of Leviticus from the very first chapter uh, going on through throughout the book of Leviticus. It talks about the sacrifices and the temple and the ministry in the temple and all that it was. But in the interest of time, I'm just summarizing and pray that you would go back and study for yourself. And as they would bring the animal and the priest would take it and he would examine it to make sure that it was a perfect sacrifice, it had no spot, it had no blemish. And then the sinner that brought that animal would now have to take that animal and shed the blood of that animal, slit the throat of that animal and hold it and literally see the life ooze out of that animal, that lamb. And so John the Baptist, John the Baptist now as he began to preach the ministry of repentance, the message rather of repentance on the river Jordan and the people began to crowd to him to hear of what he was speaking that the hour has come for men and women to, be, to repent and to give their hearts to the Lord to reform their lives. And as he was preaching one day, he lifted up his head and he saw an individual that is coming towards him. And he was garbed, this individual, he was garbed pretty much like the peasants and others that came to, to be baptized. But the Holy Spirit moved upon John's heart. Because as he looked upon this individual, even though he was dressed like a peasant, he walked like a king. His symmetry was perfect. His walk, his presence, his very presence was awe-inspiring. And so John would declare to the people, Behold, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter, tells us now more about the sacrifice of Jesus and how it was prefigured in the Jewish uh, uh, sanctuary. And so he writes in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, picking up in verse 11. But Christ being come as an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So Paul is saying that Jesus Christ, first of all, First of all, and we'll study more about that in a few minutes, that he has come not only as our high priest, but he has come also as the lamb, Amen. the lamb that was being slain. And so he continued, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, where is Jesus Christ? He has entered into the holy place today, into the most holy place where he is, still pleading for you and I, 
No, it wasn't over on Easter morning so that we could go back and live in sin and then come a year from now and say we celebrating Easter. It was given to us, the sacrifice of Jesus, for us to know of the love of God and the justice of God in dealing with sin. Paul continues, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. And so as the Jewish people would go through this ritual, it would be pointing to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who take it away, the sin of the world. Amen. The Apostle Peter understood it very well, and so he would write, one that accepted the fact that Jesus was, in fact, the true Messiah, that he is the one that was being represented by every animal that was sacrificed in the Jewish economy. Peter would now write in the book of First Peter, and the second, uh, uh, and the first chapter, beginning in verse seventeen. And if ye be called on the Father, who without respect of persons judge it according to to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here on fear. In other words, Peter is saying that God is no respecter of persons and that as we come and we accept Jesus Christ, what they have done for P, what he has done for Peter, he would do for you and I. And then Peter continued in verse 18. For as much as we know that Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So Peter is saying that looking back then, talking primarily to the Jewish believers, but to all believers and many, many of them, all the original disciples were Jews. So we need to be careful how we talk about the Jewish nation. The Messiah is Jewish. Most of the uh, early believers, uh, they were Jewish. And so Peter is now saying to them, what you were doing back then, they were simply pointing to the true Lamb of God that would come and give his life. And Peter continued, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, that is what took place on Calvary about 2,000 years ago. Is that God through the ancient sanctuary as he was revealing to the uh, Jewish people with the sacrifices has now revealed to us the reality of Jesus giving his life on, on Calvary's cross. Why? For us to have a celebration and continue to sing and swim and continue to trample upon his laws, particularly his holy Sabbath day as we shared last week. People remember Good Friday. They remember Easter Sunday. Nowhere to be found in here that God has called us to commemorate those days. But they trample. They trample as it whole as on of this holy and blessed Sabbath day, the only day that he has called us to keep. My dear brothers and sisters, as the lamb was now slain, the priest would now take the blood which was caught in a basin. And he would now proceed to first of all, anoint the altar of sacrifice where the sacrifice was made. And then he would take a portion of that blood and he would move into the holy place, the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. And as he moved into the sanctuary, as he moved into the sanctuary on his right, in the first apartment of the sanctuary was the altar of sure bread, which had 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 nations of Israel. And yes, every Sabbath morning, 
the priest would bring fresh bread, fresh bread into the sanctuary. I pray that on this Sabbath that you are getting some fresh bread. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, the fresh bread wasn't given on Friday. It wasn't given on Sunday. It wasn't given on any other day of the week. But on the Sabbath morning, the priest would bring fresh bread to replenish those that were there. But what is that bread? Was that bread all about? In the book of John, chapter 6 and verse 35, we find these words. Jesus uh, 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 speaking in John chapter 6 and the 35th verse. We, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken there. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, please uh, 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 forgive me. John chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12. The Bible reads, Therefore, brethren, of the adepters, um, missed my scripture, please forgive me, uh, our brothers and sisters. John chapter 6, that's where I need to go. John chapter 6, and let's find, um, I'm looking at Romans. No matter, no wonder I can't find it. I'm looking in the wrong place. Please forgive me. It is because of, you see, we are all brothers and sisters. We are striving to become uh, more like Jesus. But going back to John chapter 6, that's where I want to go. And verse 35. Thank you, Jesus. Please uh, uh, pardon the mix up. The Jesus says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he that uh, cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Amen. Jesus declared that that bread that was represented in the sanctuary was verily foreshadowing him that would come. And he now continued in verse 51 of the first chapter of the same chapter, chapter 6 of John. He says, I am, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread and he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the Bible continues to tell us that as Jesus continued to preach about himself being the bread of life and that men should eat his, eat his uh, uh, flesh and, and drink his blood. Some of them say that this was a strong saying. How could we believe that? How could we do that? Of course, there are millions of people around the world today that believe that sinful men could, could turn bread into the body of Christ and then turn wine into the blood of Christ and then they eat it and drink it and basing that concept on what Christ has spoken here. But I thank God again for his word because as many of them decided to leave, there were some of them, Peter and others, that when Jesus asked them, would you also leave? They said, where will we go? Who else have the word of life? And then Jesus declared unto them, you see, we need to stick with Jesus even when we don't quite understand, even when times are hard, because he's going to make it clear to us eventually. And so he made it clear to, to Peter and those that remained. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So Jesus is saying it is his word that we need to eat. Moment by moment, day by day. My dear brothers and sisters, as we study God's word, we are transformed into his image. And that's what Jesus was telling them. As you study the word, as you partake of the word, the word that is given to us, the written word, then what happens in our lives, we transform into the image of the living word, is, who is none other than Jesus Christ. And now as the priest, now leave as he comes in on his right hand, was is the table of the showbread. Jesus declared that I am the bread of life. On his left hand was the seven branch candlestick. 
but what were they pointing to? In the same book of John, in the 8th chapter, and verse 12, the Jesus would declare, I am, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And so the seven branch candlestick was used to, to light the entire sanctuary. And Jesus is saying that that light, that I in fact am that real light. This is the reality that was just the pattern. But I want to thank God this morning that Jesus has done something remarkable to those of us that have committed our lives to him. Jesus would declare to us, ye are, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a light, a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. What did the light do, the seven branch candlestick? It gave light to the entire sanctuary. And so Jesus says, now not only am I the light, but when you give your life to me, you now become the light of the world. He says, let your light show sign that men should see your good works and glorify your Father, which art in heaven. And so as we linger, Amen. as we linger in the first apartment of the sanctuary, yes, we see the show bread and Jesus declared himself to be the bread of life. As we look at the seven branch candlestick that lighted the sanctuary, Jesus declared that I am the light of the world. But right before the priests, as you come in, there was the altar. This where there was the altar of incense. And by the way, my dear brothers and sisters, the blood that was taken out of the courtyard where the animal was sacrificed, as I said, was now brought into the sanctuary. That blood, that blood represented, it was in figure, the life of the sinner. The life of the sinner because the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us that the life is in the blood. And what we need is a blood transfusion. And this is what was being taught in the sanctuary. The priest was now come in and he would take some of that blood, sprinkle it on the altar, sprinkle it on the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, the eighth chapter, John now gets a vision into the heavenly sanctuary. And this is what he sees in the book of John chapter eight, the book of Revelation chapter eight rather. This is what John writes. And I saw, and beginning in verse three, and another angel came and stood by the altar, the altar of incense, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, the throne, the mercy seat of God was in the most holy place, but that veil that separated the holy from the most holy place, now John gets a view and he sees the altar and he says the incense that was offered on the altar, that it was mingled with the prayers of the saints. My dear brothers and sisters, the incense also represented the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Without his prayers, the, without his, the mixing of his righteousness with our prayers, our prayers that are, are in vain. And this is why it has become customary when we pray, we say it in the name of Jesus. But it is much more than that. It is the righteousness of, of Jesus Christ that makes our prayers acceptable to our Father. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that gives us understanding of his word as we study. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that makes our witnessing, our witnessing to be effective to make our lights shine. And so my dear brothers and sisters, 
as we continue to look at salvation in the sanctuary, we come to uh, realize that what happened last week as we celebrated the Easter holidays, many of you, that the reality is that it was pointing to Jesus Christ, a lesson that was taught thousands of years ago to the Jewish uh, 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 nation. I like the way that the prophet, the prophet Isaiah puts it in the book of Isaiah, the 54th uh, uh, chapter. This is what Isaiah writes about that sacrifice that took place there on Calvary's cross. He says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. But God and everyone, we've turned everyone to our own ways. But the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Oh yes, the Passover lamb celebrated for thousands of years by the Jewish nation, celebrated now on the Easter holidays by Christ, like by, as Easter. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, that's what was prefigured. And as we look at the sacrifice of Jesus, we <coughs> must come to realize what Jesus Christ had done for us. Last week we talked about the sacrifice, we talked about the first fruits that Jesus at his resurrection uh, represented the first fruits. And we find in 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter and verse 20 the Bible tells us, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. And after that they that are Christ at his coming. And we know that at this coming, the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive shall be re and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. And so shall we be with the Lord. Amen. The first fruits. And then he's coming back <coughs> to gather the rest, to gather the rest of the harvest that you and I, following the feast of the first fruits, there was the feast of Pentecost that took place 50 days after the crucifixion. And we find in the book of Leviticus, the 23rd uh, uh, chapter, the Bible reads, and ye shall come down to you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought in the, uh, the first sheaves, the day of the first fruits. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall, ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And so in the Jewish economy, it was not just the feast of the Passover and of our even break, the feast of the first fruits. Fifty days later, it was the feast of the Pentecost. Oh, but what does that have to do with Jesus Christ? Remember today, we're talking about salvation in the sanctuary. It was 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And in the book of Acts, we find this account. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a wind from the heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I want to let you know it was but not with any unintelligible tongues that they were speaking or languages, but they were speaking in different known languages because the Jewish people had now come from all parts of the world where they were scattered on the day of Pentecost. And as they came on that particular day of Pentecost, God now empowered the disciples to speak in different languages. So each one of them from wherever they may have come they may have been living for years in different parts of the of the world, in, 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 in Africa, other parts of Asia, or where have you. And a lot of them have forgotten their languages. But God in his mercy and his grace empowered the disciples to speak in those languages so that they could hear the word of salvation. 
the Holy Spirit was poured out in great measure. And the Bible records that just on that one day, over 5,000 men, besides women and children, accepted the word of salvation, accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But now following, following the feast of, the, uh, of Pentecost, the Bible tells us of the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Atonement that kind of were linked together. And in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter again, and beginning in verse 24, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, in the feast day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath. Oh yes, those feast days were all called Sabbaths, and that's which was nailed to the cross. We don't have to keep these feast days and, and sacrifice animals because the true Lamb of God has given his life on Calvary's cross. A memorial of blowing the trumpets, it's a holy convocation. Then it continues, and also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement, it shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So what is happening here? For 10 days, for 10 days, the priests would go out to the congregation and, and blow the trumpets. And basically he is telling the people that the day of atonement is coming, the day of atonement is coming. It was a serious time, the day of atonement, because as we read the account of the day of atonement in the 16th, um, chapter of the uh, of the book of Leviticus this is what we discover about the day of atonement and this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month and the tenth day of the month ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all whether it be of your own country or of a stranger that sojourneth among you for on that day the priest shall make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And so now on the day of atonement, the only day that the high priest would go into the most holy place, and in the most holy place of the sanctuary, what we find was the mercy seat. And below the mercy seat was the law of God. My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus is the white linen curtain of a righteousness. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. Jesus is the priest and the high priest that ministers before God for us. Jesus is the bread of life that was represented by the 12 loaves of bread in the holy place. Jesus is the light of the world that was represented by the seven branch candlestick. Jesus, rep uh, our righteousness is represented by the incense that was offered with the prayers of the saints. We come into the most holy place. Jesus is our mercy seat because the mercy seat sits above the law that was broken and it's only because of the mercy of God that we are all not destroyed. Think with me for the moment. If Jesus is everything that the, the sanctuary represents, what do you think that the law represented? It represented Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the law. My dear brothers and sisters, that's why God sent him. Because he knew that in our own strength, in our own flesh, we can't keep his law. But he sent Jesus Christ, uh, Paul tells us, in the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, this is what the apostle Paul writes. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, I love the word of God because no one needs to be deceived. God has made it very plain for us. And this is what the Bible says. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul continues, for what the law could not do in that it is weak through the flesh, in other words, 
you and I, in our own flesh, are totally incapable of keeping God's law. But why did he send Jesus Christ? So that we should continue to sin? No, Paul says. This is what Paul says. God sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. How could you separate Jesus Christ from his, from his law, my dear brothers and sisters, as is so much taught out there? We come to Jesus, we don't have to keep the law. Well, my Bible tells me as we look in the sanctuary that Jesus is the law. Amen. That Jesus is the mercy seat that gives us pardon from breaking the law. My Bible tells me that this same Jesus is the bread of life. That this same Jesus is the door through which we come to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He declared, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so now, on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, my dear brothers and sisters, in which we now live on planet Earth, oh yes, the feast of Passover has come and gone. Jesus has been crucified. The first fruits has come and gone. He resurrected from the tomb. Unleavened bread has come and gone. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. Pentecost has come and gone. My dear brothers and sisters, on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached with so, pump, so much power that thousands of transformed. The Feast of Trumpets, my dear brothers and sisters, continues to sound as the gospel call goes out, perhaps even this morning to someone to tell you to make it right with Jesus. Because that day of atonement is a serious time. It's a time in which we live and God is calling on us to make it right with him, to cleanse us just as they did in the ancient sanctuary. God is calling you and I to make it right with him. If we look at the Jewish encyclopedia, how they describe the Day of Atonement. It says, God, seated on his throne to judge the world, at the same time judge, pleader, expert, and witness opened up the book of records. That's what Jesus is doing now, my dear brothers and sisters. Looking at your life and looking at my life and pleading with us for us to make it right with him. And there is only one way to make it right with Jesus, to make it right with God. Not with our singing and our swinging. Not with our shouting. There's only one way to make it right with God, is to keep all of his commandments. The wise man Solomon writes, For fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the only way for us to make it right. And so the Jewish Encyclopedia, describing the Day of Atonement, now writes, it is read, every man's nature and life that is found therein. The trumpet is sounded, a still voice is heard, angels shall the same. This is the day of judgment, a day of judgment, a day of cleansing. For his ministers are not pure before God, as a shepherd, mustereth his flock causing them to pass on to his rod so that God so that God caused every living soul to pass on before him to fix the limit of every creature's life and to foreordain his destiny. Listen to this. On the day of atonement, it is sealed who shall live and who shall die. And so it was back in the, the Jewish economy as we looked at the sanctuary on the day of atonement. The high priest would go in and minister into, in the most holy place, wherein lay the, the, the law of God. And then he would come out and he would look upon the congregation. And then those that had made it right with God, however the Lord uh, revealed it to the high priest, they went on to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They left their houses and they built 
booths, as it was called, either in their houses or outside, but they came out from where they were and spent the Feast of Tabernacles. And then after the Feast of Tabernacles, they went back and they went through the process for another year. But I want to let you know that this antitypical Day of Atonement, which it was prefiguring, there is no coming back to celebrate for another year. You make it right with God now, or you are lost forever. And when Jesus shall come, when Jesus shall come to call his own, then, my dear brothers and sisters, surely we would go to spend the Feast of Tabernacles in the heavenly sanctuary in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation and the 20th chapter, the Bible tells us, beginning in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the image, neither had received their mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with the Lord for a thousand years, the Feast of Tabernacles. But now before we get there, before we get there, God is calling us. Paul says, seeing that we have such a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession, for we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but is in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus now is pleading as our high priest, but he is not going to be pleading forever. Because just as the heavenly high priest came out from the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, back in the Jewish economy, as we look at salvation in the sanctuary, the reality high priest, the real high priest, is ministering in our behalf on the heavenly sanctuary, but one day, one day it's soon going to be over. And this is what is declared as I close. In the book of Revelation, the fourth, in the book of Revelation, the 22nd chapter, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and which it is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates thereof. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, it's all about keeping the law of God. And that is what the sanctuary taught in type. God's plan of salvation. And as I said earlier, as I close, let me recap. The Feast of Passover, his sacrifice is come and gone. His Sabbath rest remains and will always remain. It was there before man was created. It was there before sin. And it would remain throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. The Feast of First Fruits has come and gone. And yes, my dear brothers and sisters, God has a people that he is preparing, that when he shall come, he shall gather in his harvest. The Feast of Pentecost, as was experienced on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We're now living in the Feast of Trumpets and Atonement. God is calling somebody today to make it right with him. If you love me, keep my commandments, he says. And then he declares, it's only those that keep his commandments will be entering into the gate, into that holy city. I've said a lot today. 
but I haven't said enough. And as time progresses, we will go back and look in more detail into all of those feasts that we have touched upon today. I have barely scratched the surface. Oh, and I know that I have. It was uh, intentional. Just wanted to give us an idea, an idea of what salvation is really all about, how it was revealed to the ancient Jewish people in the sanctuary, but how in reality it is being revealed to us through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. May God help us that when he shall come, that all of you within the hearing of my voice will certainly go and spend that feast of tabernacles with him and then return to this earth as the Jewish people return to their homes at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. But this time, this time around, it would not be to go through that ritual for another year, but it would be to live with him throughout the ceaseless of years of, of eternity in the earth made hill. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us this morning. I pray that have you spoken to us, I know my heart was touched. I, Pray that some other heart was touched and that some man, some woman would get a better understanding of who you are and what you were doing. Would get a better understanding of that holiday they celebrated, what it means and what God requires of them. May you continue to draw your people in this day of judgment, this day of cleansing, this day of atonement in which we live. Because soon and very soon, dear Father, the door of mercy will be closed. Let us hear your voice as you plead with us. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. One day, that pleading will stop and there will be no more hope for anyone that has rejected your pleas. Thank you for speaking to us. Help us this morning to commit and recommit our lives to you, that you will make us more like you, that when you shall appear, we shall see you as you are, for we will be like you. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. <laughs>